As we go into January of 1918, let's remind ourselves of kind of the context, the background that's going on, especially relative to World War I. First of all, in April of 1917, so a lot of the context is what happened in 1917, you have the US declares war on declares war on Germany. And the, the main argument they give is this unrestricted submarine warfare that the Germans are undertaking. You also have the fall of the Russian Empire, fall of Russian, Russian Empire. You have the, uh, essentially the revolution that overthrows the Tsar in February, March of 1917. And then in October, you have the Bolsheviks take over in a coup. Now the fall, this essentially, the Bolsheviks, once they take over, they're, they have no interest in terms of continuing the war with Germany. So you have a, an armistice declared, and the Russians are in the process of negotiating the terms of a treaty with the Central Powers. So they're kind of negotiating the Brest-Litovsk Treaty as we speak. Now, on top of that, you have, because the Central Powers don't have to focus on Russia on the Eastern Front anymore, they are trying to uh, bring their, their, especially Germany is trying to bring its troops back to the Western Front. And they want to do it before the U.S. can mobilize in any significant way. So race, race on Western Front, Western Front. Between, essentially, can Germany get its troops and do an offensive that can put probably France, out of the war before the U.S. has a chance to significantly reinforce the Western Front. So this is essentially between German re redeployed troops from the Eastern Front, German troops, troops from Eastern, from Eastern Front versus new American troops versus new Americans. So this is the backdrop. No one really knew what exactly was going to happen on the Western Front. Certain military analysts would say, well, look, Germany was able to prosecute this two-front war against a major empire in Russia. Now that they're going to be able to focus completely on the Western Front, Germany might be able to kind of deal the decisive blow. Others would say, well, look, the US, it's this, it's this emerging power. It's bringing fresh troops in. It has a major industrial capacity. Uh, the US could, if, especially if the war were to last a good bit, the US might make, be the decisive, uh, the decisive element for the allies. So that's the background in which President Wilson President Woodrow Wilson, on January of 1918, January 8th, gives a speech to the joint sessions of Congress. And this is a part of the text of the speech. And I'm just going to read through it. I'm not going to read the entire speech. He talks about many things. Essentially, why are we in World War I? What is the moral causes of World War I? And the speech is most famous for his articulation of the 14 points. So let's just read into it because it, it really informs a lot of what happened in the Treaty of Versailles, uh, that which is essentially the peace treaty with Germany, which the U.S. ironically did not ratify. But it also kind of uh, lays out the, the, the tension in, in the Paris peace conferences after World War I between those who were more idealistic, like Woodrow Wilson, and those who might have been a little bit more vengeful, especially against the central powers. So here we go. This is part of the speech. We entered this war because violations of right had occurred, which touched us to the quick and made the life of our own people impossible, unless they were corrected and the world secured once for all against their recurrence. What we demand in this war, therefore, is nothing peculiar to ourselves. It is that the world be made fit and safe to live in. This is very idealistic. Remember, all these other, especially these European powers, they're all about who gets what land, who gets what empire, uh, who gets to kind of uh, uh, take advantage of, of whatever colony. And particularly that it be made safe for every peace-loving nation, which, like our own, wishes to live its own life, determine its, in, its own institutions, and be assured of justice and fair dealing by the other peoples of the world, as against force and selfish aggression. All the peoples of the world are in effect partners in this interest, and for our own part we see very clearly that unless justice be done to others, it will not be done to us. The program of the world's peace, therefore, is our program, and that program, the only possible program, all we see it is this. And this is, these are his 14 points. And I'll try to, to kind of give some context for each of them. So the first is open covenants of peace, openly arrived at, which after 
after which there shall be no private international understandings of any kind, but diplomacy shall proceed always frankly and in the public view. And the context here is actually after the Bolsheviks took over, they started releasing all these secret the secret covenants and, and understandings that the Russian Empire had been getting into. And a lot of, we've already talked about all of the entanglements and the alliances that led to World War I. And so this is Wilson's attempt to say, hey, look, let's just do everything out in the open. That'll, that'll, that'll let everyone kind of know, uh, give more transparency, what may or may not occur based on their actions. Number two, absolute freedom of navigation upon the upon the seas, outside territorial waters alike in peace and in war, except as the seas may be closed in whole or in part by international action for the enforcement of international covenants. So no more of these British blockades, no more of this unrestricted submarine warfare. The only time we could kind of dictate what happens in, in open waters is if it's the international community trying to decide that it wants to enforce international covenants. Number three, the removal of all economic barriers and the establishment of equality of trade conditions among all the nations consenting to the peace and associating themselves for its maintenance. So essentially free trade. Free, free trade. Number four, adequate guarantees given and taken that national armaments will will be reduced to the lowest point consistent with domestic safety. So he's trying to undo some of this, this militarism, this, this buildup this, of arms that, that uh, helped uh, start the world, the, uh, essentially allowed World War I to happen with the ferocity that it did and, and the quickness with which it did. Number five, a free, open-minded, and absolutely impartial adjustment of all colonial claims based upon a strict observance of the principle that in determining all such questions of sovereignty, the interests of the populations concerned must have equal weight with the equitable claims of the government whose title is to be determined. So this is a big deal that probably did not make the British or the French happy. This is essentially saying, look, self-determination, the people who, who, who are in those, in those nations, in those states, they should be able to, their interests matter just as much. So an, a free, open-minded, absolutely impartial adjustment of all colonial claims. So this is, this is a pretty big deal. Remember, we're kind of exiting this period of empires. Most of the European powers still think that these international empires are, are essentially part of their, their prestige. Number six, the evacuation of all Russian territory and such a settlement of all questions affecting Russia as will secure the best and freest cooperation of the other nations of the world in obtaining for her an unhampered and unembarrassed opportunity for the independent determination of her own political development and national policy and assure her of a sincere welcome into the society of free nations under institutions of her own choosing. This is still one sentence, and then he doesn't even put a period there, semicolon, and I guess he had to read it himself, and more than a welcome assistance also of every kind that she may need and may herself desire. The treatment accorded Russia by her sister nations in the months to come, remember, they're negotiating with the central powers on Brest-Litovsk, to come will be the acid test of their goodwill, of their comprehension of her needs as, distingu as distinguished from her own interests, and of their intelligent and unselfish sympathy. So it's saying, look, I mean, Wilson doesn't know whether the allies or the central powers are going to win on the Western front, but they know that the, the central powers are dictating terms to Russia with Brest-Litovsk. It's like, look, you, this is going to be a test of, of your goodwill, of your comprehension of the needs of this kind of newly emerging uh, 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 state uh, now that the Bolsheviks have taken over. Obviously, at this point, you don't have the, anti the antagonism between uh, the U.S. and, and the, the future Soviet Union that, that is going to emerge. They're saying, look, give, give Russia a chance to kind of be, be, be herself. Number seven, Belgium, the whole world will agree, must be evacuated and restored without any attempt to limit the sovereignty which she enjoys in common with all other free nations. And so uh, this is kind of obvious Belgium when the Russian when the Germans rolled through Belgium uh, that's how they got to France it was a justification that Great Britain used for entering the war so look get out of Belgium number eight all French territory should be freed and the invaded portions restored and the wrong done to France by Prussia in 1871 in the matter of Alsace-Lorraine, which has unsettled the peace of the world for nearly 50 years, should be righted in order that peace may once more be made secure in the interest of all. So Alsace-Lorraine, we've touched on it several times. That's 
That's this region right over here. It was taken by Germany, essentially the unification of Germany during the Franco-Prussian War. This was a mineral-rich region. This was one of the justifications. This was what, why, why France might have gone into a war with Germany and what Germany almost wanted to be preemptive against France because they, they said, hey, France might want to take some of, that, some of that territory back. Nine, a readjustment of the frontiers of Italy should be affected along clearly recognizable lines of nationality. Hey, where do people speak Italian? Number 10, the peoples of Austria-Hungary, whose place among the nations we wish to see safeguarded and assured, should be accorded the freest opportunity to autonomous development. So this is another big deal. It's another breaking up of an empire. It's another self-determination point of, of the 14 points. Austria-Hungary, we've already said it was an empire. It included many, many, many nationalities. You have the Czechs right around there. You have the Slovaks right around there. You have the Austrians, German-speaking people, right, right over there. You have the Hungarians roughly over there. You have the Slovenians roughly over there. You have the Croatians roughly over there. You have the Bosnians roughly over there. And, I'm, you, know, and, and you have many, many other na nationalities, especially as you get close to the border with Romania and the border with the Ukraine. And it's like, let these people determine, let, let them determine their own fate to some degree. There are all these nationalities. So that was number 10. The freest opportunity to autonomous development. And it's not, he's not saying that they necessarily need their own states, but that they should have the opportunity to kind of self-govern in some way. Number 11, Romania, Serbia, and Montenegro should be evacuated, occupied territories restored. Serbia accorded free and secure access to the sea and the relations of the several Balkan states to one another determined by friendly counsel along historically established lines of allegiance and nationality. And international guarantees of the political and economic independence and territorial integrity of the several Balkan states should be entered to. And so this is kind of laying the groundwork for the future state of for the future state of Yugoslavia, which is going to be, which is going to be roughly over there, this kind of the state of the southern Slavs, which is what the, the whole motivation by Gravilo Princip for kind of assassinating Archduke Archduke Ferdinand, which some would argue was kind of the spark that lit World War One. The Turkish portion of the present Ottoman Empire should be assured a secure sovereignty. But the other nationalities, which are now under Turkish rule, should be assured an undoubted security of life and an absolutely unmolested opportunity of autonomous development. Once again, self-determination. And the Dardanelles should be permanently opened as a free passage to the ships, to the ships and commerce of all nations under international guarantees. So the Dardanelles, we've talked about it before. That is, that's this right over here, so that you have access between the Aegean Sea and the Black Sea. And we are almost there. So then you have an independent Polish state should be erected. An independent Polish state should be erected, which should include the territories inhabited by the indisputably Polish populations, which should be assured of free and secure access to the sea, and whose political and economic independence and territorial integrity should be guaranteed by international covenant. So Poland did not exist as its own state prior to World War I. Now you have Woodrow Wilson is advocating it, and it will be carved out roughly of this area right over there. And then finally, finally, point 14, a general association of nations must be formed under specific covenants for the purpose of affording mutual guarantees of political independence and territorial integrity to great and small stakes, states alike. So this is essentially, this is the point that leads to the formation of the League of Nations. And this is a, you know, when we talk about big ideas, this is a big idea, especially back then. You have this Europe that keeps getting into wars with each other. Hey, why don't we all cooperate, uh, cooperate at this kind of meta level and, and we have this, 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 this club of all of the nations to kind of resolve disputes and, and, you know, and, 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 and make sure that we don't have another World War I. So very, very, very big, very, very big idealistic idea. It gets formed during the treaty of, or as, a, as an outcome of the Treaty of Versailles, which, which, is ratified, or which, is, which is drafted during the Paris peace conferences after World War I. The unfortunate thing of the League of Nations is that even though this was kind of the idea was coming from Woodrow Wilson, uh, the, the Treaty of Versailles and, and the League of Nations was, was not ratified by the U.S. So the U.S. never entered the League of Nations, which kind of made it a little bit hollow. 
and the League of Nations did not have the power to stop World War II from happening only only a, only a few decades only a few decades later and it will later be replaced by the United Nations but this is a really 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 big idea and because of these big ideas uh, Woodrow Wilson these very idealistic ideas I mean you know everyone in Europe is talking about territory and imperialism and how do they how do they take control of other people take control of their resources and now you have the American president say look it's all about self-determination it's about making the world safe for democracy f- safe for commerce about open about open agreements so it's a very powerful idea and this would kind of form the basis kind of the more idealistic side of American foreign policy over the 20th century some would say that there's another very cynical side that uh, takes uh, uh, into account self-interest, but this is this is the the idealistic side of American foreign policy, especially through the 20th century. And for this, for his work in this in this area, Woodrow Wilson wins the Nobel Prize a few years later. So this right here is a picture of what the Nobel Prize looks like, both sides of it. Now, and just to kind of foreshadow some of the tension as we get into the Paris Peace Conference, not everyone was as idealistic. You obviously have these European powers who bled much harder than the Americans did, although the Americans did have did contribute significant cost or you know troops to the effort, and they lost many, many, many folks. But obviously, if you're French, you had these Germans on your territory, you lost a significant fraction of your population, a huge fraction of your male population, you might be a little bit angrier. And so, of course, you have Georges Clemenceau, who was the prime minister of France, and, and he was a little bit more skeptical of the 14 points. This is a quote from him. and He has, actually has many slightly entertaining quotes. Mr. Wilson bores me with his 14 points. Why, God Almighty has only 10. And this will kind of this foreshadow some of the tension between uh, Clemenceau the, uh, and, and the British and, and kind of the, the European allies on one side and the Americans as we go into the Paris Peace Conference. They were a little bit looking out more for revenge, especially against the Germans, while the Americans, especially Woodrow Wilson, was a little was actually a lot more idealistic.